the Palm Fox House here, uh, then you know um, uh, how incredible uh, projects they can be. We have another one going in town uh, here, which is uh, Ray Curse House. Ray is here. Um, and uh, this one started a couple months back, and we just set containers uh, yesterday out. So these pictures are all fresh. I'm just going to go through a couple of them because uh, it's fun to see. Um, these containers were cut ahead of time and uh, put in place. Um, it went smoothly. Every container was set uh, in one day, uh, including insulating them underneath. Uh, that's where this one, actually that was being set. Um, they were insulated underneath and then set in place uh, all in a day with some prep ahead of time. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is uh, really, is it a good idea? Because um, I put a lot of thought into this. Tom's, Tom came to me with his project, um, and we just went and did it. Uh, we, we based uh, a lot of what we did on uh, assumptions, knowledge out there on the internet in terms of how environmentally friendly the process is, and what it means to use uh, old steel boxes as a building material. And, um, done a couple of projects since then. i also done a little bit of research into trying to figure it out. So uh, do they make sense? I'm just going to track over very quickly if they make environmental sense, economic sense, and cultural sense. Those are three kind of things you might look at. So <clears throat> we know they're strong. Uh, we know they last. Uh, the ones that we've been using are usually over 10 years old, sometimes as old as 12, 15 years old. Um, the modularity of them can be both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, they're meant to uh, be stacked a certain way. Uh, they're easy to transport, um, but you're transporting a large empty thing. It's not like it's compact not building material. You've got a pair of more of it time. Crank that thing to your specials. And then um, uh, the sustainability of them. Well, the common knowledge is always that every container has about 8,000 pounds of steel which takes about 8,000 kilowatt hours of energy to melt down and recycle. But how many of them actually are recycled? Um, the other common knowledge is that it takes about 400 kilowatt hours of energy to upcycle these things. So cut them and modify them and put them into new use. Um, we wanted to take a longer look at it. So uh, together with Brad Guy, uh, who you guys might know from history here, uh, we did a life cycle analysis of this as a building material and compared Tom Fox's home built out of container to Tom Fox's home built with two traditional stick construction. Um, we compared three types of shipping containers. We compared brand new shipping containers, uh, shipping containers still in use, in other words, not at the end of their first uh, life, and then shipping containers the way we've been using them which is at the end of their current life cycle. Um, so uh, human health criteria, uh, you're going to see here um, dark green as the traditionally built, as the built home, and light green, which is what we use, which is end of life cycle container. And then the other two in between um, show the impact of uh, containers of a different age. So you can see once you get to the um, uh, completely upcycled shipping container, it's doing pretty well compared to conventional construction. But if you take a look at using a new shipping container, you're not doing well at all. I mean, a lot has to do with the age of these things. So it just makes sense environmentally only if you're truly using a essentially waste product and upcycle. Um, eutrophication, so you know this is, has to do with um, <coughs> the uh, poisoning of uh, resources. So here you have uh, right. the traditional, not doing so badly, but still the shipping container uh, at the end of life cycle. Uh, and then the eutrophication potential also. Um, does very well. Now the annual operational energy that you're seeing all the same at the end is because we 
chose to assume that the exact same systems are in place, the exact same amount of insulation. We know, though, from uh, the way stick built construction is built and the way Tom's house is built, which is very tight, that it's likely that he also saves a tremendous amount more energy, um, perhaps, than the stick built construction as well. Does it make sense uh, environmentally? Well, um, only if you're within 400 miles or so of the port. If you're out in the middle of uh, the Midwest, unless there happens to be some train get somewhere and, and stay there and are purchasable, then it doesn't make sense because you're going to be trucking them too far. And that's, that's sort of the basic So speaking of Tom's house particularly, um, he still uses less energy that he generates for the kilowatt array. It's tight. Um, we oriented the house properly. Is that a green uh, cafe and coffee special for somebody? Very well insulated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, probably one of the best energy savers. He used it for any splits um, to cool it. Um, I thank Mary for that suggestion. Uh, so once, um, and I won't go into the details on how this house works from, from um, one feed to the other just quite well. So I had an opportunity over the last year to do a feasibility study with a group called um, Crisis Housing Solutions that uh, began as a Wilma rescue group trying to place people in homes after Hurricane Wilma. They went to Katrina and did the same thing. They came home from those hurricanes and then they weren't in it for a while. And so they converted into a, a financial crisis uh, response group. They have a tremendous uh, partnering team, and they put people uh, back in houses that either have been thrown out for foreclosure. Uh, they also did a program where they replaced 86 units of um, modular housing in Broward County. Uh, and while they were doing that, they they were removing these crappy old mobile homes, essentially, and they were putting in new mobile homes. And they were saying, why are we doing this? You know. Uh, they're a little better, but they're not that much better. Uh, and the uh, director is from, his family is from the Netherlands. And when he went over there, he saw shipping containers, so he came back gung ho on the idea. Well, in order to really put it in place, you had to determine it was economically feasible. And so that's what my study was about. We did a couple of investigations of uh, single family. So uh, this is a, a three two. You see they're filling in containers. It's pretty conventional split plan, uh, something marketable, and then uh, one made of block. Now down in Broward County, you don't build things on studs, really. You don't waste your time with that. Uh, that pretty much everything is block. So this is uh, one of the cost estimate wise, we came up with about a 5% It's not really enough to even consider it a savings. I mean, if you're talking about you know, around $100,000, it, it looks like something there. But um, chances are it's not a conventional construction type, so your percentage is going to get eaten up like that. Um, yeah, I have your eyes thinking open. about Ray's house, which is under construction now, it's not any less expensive, really, than a conventional home. Uh, his also has cladding on the outside, which does increase the cost uh, slightly. But where you would save is, uh, of course, uh, if you're doing work yourself. And that would be the case with the house. Uh, looking at it at another scale, this is where things get more interesting. Uh, this is a, a typical block in Davie, Florida. Uh, it's also kind of a typical block to Florida in general. It's about two and a acres um, and this is a uh, layout of uh, some shipping container units uh, in that block uh, and 
very same for the bottom of the premiums. There's a, a one bedroom unit, or sorry, there's two efficiencies, uh, and then one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, all stacked then within uh, the complex. Um, this achieved the savings of more than 15%. And if you take that over quite a larger budget, like, you know, uh, $2 million or whatever, then you start to actually save some money. A lot of the savings is also um, what you would expect from uh, modular construction. So this is a compression of time. So there's a savings in the schedule, and therefore general conditions, and things like this. Um, and then that original, the initial savings that you saw with the single family units of about 7% is on envelope. So it is actually cheaper if you do it right to take the steel box and reinforce it than it is to put uh, masonry, reinforced masonry in place. Um, how does that work and does it matter? Well, the, the impact is, is pretty great because if you reduce the cost of construction by 15% and you pass that savings on to the affordable tenant, um, not only is that an improvement of, on the amount of money they're spending on housing, Month, but it's also uh, makes it available to more tenants. And in uh, Broward County area, there's a significant number of falls in the uh, where uh, the uh, amount they can pay for rent uh, is that is insignificant. And I have so your, 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 um, we think we'll have a pretty large impact. The configuration I showed is of a block infill development. It's not a popular formula for developers right now, right? For a developer, you have to have 200 plus units, hopefully a greenfield site, um, so that you can make units that you can then make a profit on and rent that or below the market rent rate column, right? Or it's not gonna work. So what this slide does is show you essentially that the project that I showed you uh, on the block is not feasible, but it has primarily to do uh, with land costs, okay? So, uh, and scale. Now, can I do a 200 unit development with shipping demand? What do you think? That's what I thought. Come on, everyone says there's thousands of shipping containers sitting in ports all around the world just waiting to be recycled. Is it true? No. It's not. Now, those shipping containers that they always show pictures of are owned by the companies. They're used by the companies. They're not interested in getting rid of them. There's a small percentage of those that get dumped off every year because they're going to be below the standard of usability. And those are not as common. If I want to do that project that I showed you, or at least take a look at it, so something like this. If I want to do a project like this, I have to begin probably six months ahead of time buying containers, right? And stockpiling them. And since the plan is already known, probably beginning the modifications, getting them ready, right? So that when the time comes on the construction site, they can be put in place. Where do they have to come from? Well, um, depending on where the site is, uh, in this case in Broward County, they'll probably come from Port Everglades. Kathleen and I have um, Columbia to give. Tom's and, and I have uh, Ray is both came from uh, Jacksonville, from uh, Container Depot there. Uh, there are some Container Depots in Orlando and Tampa. Tampa is actually closed right now because they're undergoing uh, enlargement of the port for the new Panama Canal. Uh, but, you know, basically that's what they're doing. Um, and the other thing about that is that most of the containers are fairly standard. I mean, it's an ISO standard, but there's three different configurations of the bottom beam that can matter uh, when you're putting them together. And so we kind of design ways of dealing with that. Um, you notice that in those plans, we cut out all of the interior walls in there. So we've come up with a standardized way of reinforcing a container that uses very little steel 
uh, is uh, more easily implementable uh, than uh, sort of finicky cutting around, say, all the different profiles of the bottom beam. So really, it's a, it's a project of troubleshooting modularity. When I first presented that um, life cycle cost analysis, there were a lot of questions at that um, uh, meeting on modularity about how usable these things are. And it, it means you really have to establish a smart kit. Um, so, uh, so the builder formula of 200 plus units, or the developer formula of 200 plus units in a greenfield site, quite frankly, I'm not interested in that, right? A uh, greenfield site especially, uh, I'm more interested in renovation of uh, urban areas, and that is what this represents. So what does that mean? Well, as soon as you get the land, you're good to go, all right? And you're a little cheaper than conventional construction. And if you notice, have you ever seen the builder version of affordable housing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cooking better apartment blocks, right? Um, and then some semblance of social space, usually a rec center or whatever. Um, this uh, creates uh, repetitive uh, um, pedestrian scale plazas and walks through the block. Some of them are covered, at least partially. And we would be, uh, we're, we're going to be and so we should be running this through the actually. There are rooms, because the floor is going to go on the top of And this block configuration is not um, ideal yet, right? Just one second. Because it's got cars in it, and we don't have cars in it either. We want the inside of the block for people, and probably a little more density. I was just going to ask a question about where where the neighborhood would go in the urban environment because I love Tom's house, but one of the criticisms I've seen is the visual discontinuity yeah. that you get from having a more traditional neighborhood and then an industrial building. This block is actually next to industrial area. So that so that provides a traditional right. kind of it is it is truly redevelopment area. I mean similar to maybe with where you guys are. Right, uh, South Maine. That's kind of an ideal area for these kind of things. Um, Tom's is a discontinuity, but so is the habitat housing in there. Absolutely. And I agree. So, I mean, choose your discontinuity, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, basically, is what I would say. There. Now, the cultural aspect of it is what you're leading into, and that's actually that's the final slide that I'll deal with. So, um, our argument has always been in Tom's. Uh, as well, then uh, we don't have a lot of industrial space for converting in Florida, so we don't get the great malls, we don't get these great kind of places where uh, uh, you can make a mess or whatever. And containers give us kind of raw material for creating that kind of space, so culturally, maybe that's one way of looking at these things. Um, the other is that the, because of the Unit type and the way of stacking, maybe you can get some kind of space that you wouldn't get at home. You kind of build it. And these also have uh, upper level decks and things like that. So there's a variety of outdoor space we think adds to the overall quality of the project uh, itself. Um, and then um, you certainly aren't going to build a whole city out of these things, but. Um, at least, I mean, the fact that people showed up here today shows that there's a significant amount of people who might entertain themselves by living in something like this. <coughs> made out of sugar. So, um, uh, 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 here, maybe we'll try that out. More questions?
Um, all of these are designed to be to have a force and scale, so they're uh, they're covered in inch and a half foot of concrete on top of it. So I don't, I mean um, we probably could do air testing in tunnels to see if there's any kind of off gassing, but there isn't any sense of off gassing. So uh, we I know it's, it's one of the reasons people are afraid of the units. Um, if we encounter something, I guess we just put the floor up and add to the cost. I just didn't know if you could write something in an emergency agreement saying that you know, it doesn't have anything to Right. Well, they didn't have manifests, each of these containers, um, but they're not that big. You know, they don't tell you what's going on. And then the first read is so. But uh, they ship all the so you don't know where to that question. Okay. Excuse me. How much area How much is that? Is that the price of the total construction? And how much do the prices of these components vary over time? Do you have points or less? They are volatile. Um, like most building materials can be. Um, we typically, uh, we're doing one in Sarasota right now, we purchased some containers for $22.50 delivered, and I think is that about what we did here? Yeah. Yeah. So, over all that time, I think it's about the same for Ray's. We had some that were $18.50, right? And some that were $22.50, depending. And you can't tell, actually, the difference between them. It's kind of arbitrary, the pricing. Um, so, those haven't changed that much. Um, these are Class C containers, meaning that they're not necessarily watertight and they're not ship um, They they typically come with a few leaves in them, but for us it doesn't really matter. We can patch them; they will break and fine. So, um, and you had a second part of your question. Oh, yeah. Um, I have a feel. Well. There have been uh, times of greater demand, but my understanding is from uh, the guys who buy from them, that just means that they won't be there. Less so that the price goes up. Um, uh, they, they are a commodity, but they're not, it's not like steel is, where it goes up or down for the market. Yeah. yeah, we haven't encountered any real difference. And I usually, when I budget, I, I, I budget about $2,500 per tank. That's what it costs. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did you have one? Yeah, there's a about, I'm just thinking about 40 years ago, I remember a PA article about uh, modular housing mm -hmm. emerging in Canada. And they were very similar in appearance to these container units. Uh, are, uh, have you had occasion to look into lessons that came out of that experience? Because they did a lot of resistance. Yeah, well, actually, um, I haven't looked into the resistance, but you mean from people yeah. uh, in neighborhoods and things? Just, uh, yeah, there was cultural resistance. Yeah, I, we haven't because it's there and we can focus on it, but there's cultural acceptance as well. I think, well it so. seemed not to have emerged. So, I mean, of the it, modular it, area. Yeah, it came in yeah. and we really didn't see any. That was it. Montreal, uh, recently or? No, no, it's just like 40 years ago. Oh, uh, you mean like Habitat? Moshe Safi's project? No. no? Uh, I don't think so, but um, I just remember the time. I remember the article. It looked like it looked like it was basically. So, well, in regard to modularity, I mean, um, this client, uh, Crisis Housing Solutions, is, is interested in containers, but they're actually really interested in affordable housing. So they know, and I know, and we know, that if we, we want to, if we end up wanting to build a bunch of this, we actually have to explore other ways of making modular units and putting something like this together. So we'll do that. Uh, I have one in here. I just want to ask what, when these are for our county, what loans can they take? And is that part of, was that part of your economic Yeah, they're, they're impact resistant, they have impact windows. So they're the full. Plus, plus yeah. one board of chlorine? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
they're fully capable. Actually, sort of off the merits question is, I mean, the building goes very so much, county by county. Yeah. Have you found that these buildings that are in the building code that are in the county code, have you found that they're below codes in general? Have you upgraded typically meet codes or they're in the far enough above codes that you don't have to follow? They're already above. I mean, they, they have to follow the county code. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, we've we've contemplated it. this, but um, and you initially we were framing out the inside, but we didn't have a installation system on the inside. Now I think we should probably do some of that as well. Uh, these are also designed so that uh, if you're going to modify everything in place, um, there's the potential that you're going to use less steel, okay? Because you don't have to maintain the rigidity of the thing during transportation. So these are all designed to be transportable and slightly more steel for that reason. It's actually not that great of a difference. But they shift around too much. So, you know, picking them up and moving them, uh, you might crack a window. It's probably just not worth it. Anything that you do ahead of time would have to be flexible. So we'd probably be cutting openings for plumbing and electrical. We could mount some of the interior insulation system. Um, uh, cut the openings and reinforce them, but probably not build them. So, and in the schedule that I mentioned, the compression of schedule, I'm really only uh, compressing the schedule for the amount of time that I know that it takes them to put a block or cast a place concrete, you know, uh, lentils and things like this, which is actually, if you watch these things go up and stuff, it takes them a while. It takes a good while. Yes? I was wondering if there's any toxicity in the existing paint that's on these, and what, what's done to you? Uh, well, we have two alternatives. One, um, if the owner wants, we can bead blast them at the depot, and then they have to deal with the paint. Uh, so then they're coming to us freshly painted with you know, a new ETM type paint with steel. Uh, but as they are, uh, even if they come to the site, the, paint, the, the paint's not going anywhere. So it's, it's on the container, it's encapsulated on the interior for the most part, and painted over on the outside. So we haven't really had any <coughs> concerns about the paint uh, that's on them necessarily. The flooring is the only thing in the container that uh, has the capacity to soak anything up. We could have lead paint issues, but they're probably not lead, right? No, they're not lead. Because when you're cutting it, I yeah. think that might be your question. With the cutting yeah. and welding, you can make okay. a nice lead. Yeah, and um, I mean, anywhere where we're welding, we have to strip off the coatings anyway. Um, if you get a good weld. I was more curious for like a long term living if that, oh. that was going to be in effect. Yeah. Yeah, they're not lead paint for sure. It's zinc. They're zinc based. Oh, the paint? Yeah. Yeah, and you definitely want to ventilate if you're welding. Uh, we found that out. But it's a very, very good paint, obviously. Yeah. The VOCs would be long gone. So yeah. That would be a concern. So really, it's not a bad thing for the durability for you because of the quality of the paint. They do. The ones that we get are rusty. Uh, so we do treat them with the, just with the phosphoric acid.
most important thing, and actually part of the cost of doing projects is that um, it's not like uh, conventional methods of construction where engineers have a set of details that they basically give you for uh, uh, load issues. Every design is a custom design for the most part. And we're, we're developing a good part because you know, we've fine tuned it over the last three or four implementations. It's not a static thing, so we change them every time so far. Uh, I also want to mention that these are designed to be closer together on the site. So very minimal well required on the site. There's two reasons for that. There will be some insulation put in place prior to getting there. It's flammable. But it will reduce the cost. In some areas, less of it. What about long term maintenance, you know, water condensing pockets and rusting and stuff like that? <coughs> how much, um, how much up is there to do? Um, I've heard uh, a lot of the issues about conversation. We didn't have any of the cops project. Um, it really has to do with like any home. Um, you don't want to let air travel through your assemblies. It's a bottom line. Yeah, where warm air meets cool air, you want to waste there meets cool, you're going to have a problem. So it's about having good details of the joints. And then the flute cavities is another place where people would like, hear sun beating down on the exterior of the air outside. You know, worry about getting air in there and having to condense on the steel. If that, if that wall assembly is sealed upright, it would be an issue. Right? But we're also the, uh, on the just the building. Yeah. And just doing talking about I think you're going to ask? Yeah. Yeah. We, um, <coughs> we have cladding on Gray's house. But in addition to that, we have areas, and I don't have slides of that here. But we'll be able to look at it at some point after the project. Did we arrange a tour of that project? Because we did tour of the park this house. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll do that for sure. Yeah, stay on it. You're pointing to Joe. Uh, pointing to Joe. Uh, okay. He's we well, already have an interest in it. Okay, yeah. And it's actually probably a good time now because the hands have just been set. We can look at it while off the shelf. Uh, so uh, it's fun to look at it from that time. But definitely. Um, so I was, I was talking about, oh yeah, so we've actually detailed areas around the opening fence so that, and using the container doors, where Ray, who had a stroke about 10 years ago, um, can uh, put things down in order to operate the doors and come around. And so the, the home is sort of a device in that way uh, for him. Wire doors throughout um, uh, a unified concrete floor with very few thresholds. In fact, we were discussing these all night the other day, but I'm going to get as well. So, accessibility works well. So, I know it's getting close to 9 15, some of you probably want to leave. So, before that, I will be Can I have a few announcements? All right. I have, a, I'm actually supposed to be at a, a master's research okay. uh, uh, project proposal right, or presentation right now. But come to the shipping container open house, which we will get arranged, and we'll do uh, lots of questions there. <laughs> you can point to stuff and ask. So before you guys leave, a few quick announcements. One, thank you all for coming. This is actually the best attended event we've had so far for Green Cafe roughly three years ago. Um, our next two will not be until January. The first uh, Wednesday in January will be on conservation issues with Hutch Hutchison of the County Commission and uh, the Executive Director of ACT may come as well. Uh, to figure out how that can be used for land development. So that should be an interesting live event. 
discussion, January 20th, third Wednesday of the month, we'll actually have Michelle Parks from the city's uh, Parks Rec and Cultural Affairs Department speaking about their 20 year master plan, which some of you may know is one of the items that might be partially funded for you with the upcoming ballot initiative. So stay tuned for those. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mary for final announcement. Yeah, um, final announcement. Uh, a lot of you guys are here because of your interest in shipping container homes, and you probably are also interested in the small and tiny house movement. Um, you may or may not know there's a uh, housing summit that's taking place in February. As part of that housing summit, there has been an initiative that's been requested to do a one-day build of a small house during that housing summit. Um, I'm looking for volunteers, volunteers that can uh, help with uh, the design, to help with uh, procurement of materials and possibly donations of materials. And then um, we need a very carefully crafted construction yeah. schedule to make sure that this can happen. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll be able to actually put it together on that day. So if you're interested in that project, there is a Facebook page called Small House Gainesville. If you could go to Small House Gainesville and, and sign up, even if you're just interested in small houses, that would be great. Um, there's a real push in this city to uh, alleviate some of the, the building code interpretations that disallow uh, the tiny houses on wheels as well as, as uh, the very small houses. So, um, I don't know if you guys know, we've been working on small house stuff for a long time, and when we had to design a small house that you could build anywhere in Florida, we, were, we had to go up to 500 square feet, um, if, unless it was a tiny house on wheels, because certain counties would not allow anything to hold these I'm a Sarasota project. My Sarasota project had to be a thousand square feet. Yeah. And we didn't want to. So. Yeah, so we, we, we challenged a little bit of that. But um, I don't know if you're some of your Yeah, okay. But there is a huge, um, a huge movement all across the state right now. You've got cities passing new zoning to allow uh, pocket neighborhoods of small houses and even uh, tiny houses on wheels incorporated into neighborhoods. Um, it's it's just a rising tide right now. And if uh, you would like to be part of that and follow that. Uh, please join this, this Facebook page. Please help us do this project. And um, uh, if you don't have Facebook, just I'll give you a call and they'll be able to join this. Okay, thanks. Thank you, everyone.